We shall now turn to the chapter which we read together, the book of Hosea, and chapter 6, and our text for this evening is verse 1. Hosea 6, verse 1. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Come, and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Coronavirus has dramatically affected, affected the lives of every one of us. Surely it's obvious that God's judgment is upon us. As individuals, as churches, and indeed as nations. Judgment comes because of sin. God is speaking to us, calling upon us to consider our sins. To see how we have grieved the Lord. And to realize the reason why God's anger is against us. And let us remember that judgment begins at the house of God. In a sense, God's not that interested in judging and punishing the wicked. He leaves them for the judgment day. And that's why you see the wicked often prospering in health and strength and success. They have, as it were, their heaven here. And then they die. And they're punished forevermore. But with, with the Lord's people, their suffering ends when they die. But in this world, God corrects, chastises. God doesn't have spoiled children. You and I may sometimes spoil and neglect our children when they do wrong. We perhaps smile and move on. But God's not like that. He's very concerned about us. And when we sin, he wants us to feel our sin. To consider it. And to repent of it. And so, through this coronavirus, surely God is speaking to you and me. And God is calling upon us to repent, to return, to seek him. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. Well, the first thing we notice here then this, mo this evening is that God smites us. God tears us. Israel at this time were not prospering. Things were going from bad to worse. We read in the previous chapter of the moth nibbling away. And because they wouldn't respond to the moth, then we read of God being like a lion to the tribe of Ephraim, a lion that tears. Soon Assyria will invade and carry away the ten tribes into captivity. Look at Britain today. 
Thousands have died because of the coronavirus. 130,000 people in Britain have died. That's an awful lot of people. 130,000. Four million people across the world have died because of this virus. Others, many others, have been sick. Some struggling to breathe. Some in hospital, seriously ill. Many are suffering from long COVID. I have a daughter-in-law in Hungary. She had COVID a year ago. And uh, she still has no sense of smell or sense of taste. Sometimes bothered with dizziness and fatigue. Long after she's recovered. And she's just one amongst multitudes. But not just that. The economy has been badly hit. They're telling us it'll take many, many years to pay back the debts that our nation has incurred. People have lost their jobs and businesses have closed down. The effect on the church has been dramatic too. In the last year, our churches were shut for more than half the year, not allowed to come together and worship God. And then when we did come together, we weren't allowed to sing. And then we have to sit apart and we're frightened to shake hands with one another. And there's so much emphasis laid in scripture upon the kiss, the holy kiss, and the fellowship of God's people. And these things are forbidden. And Christ has given us the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And that fellowship around the Lord's table is so important. And we haven't been able to have the Lord's Supper for well over a year. And we're now together, yes, in church once more, but... There's lots of people staying away from church and many of our congregations have suffered a considerable drop in attendance. Some people are quite happy with listening in online on the so-called virtual church. And they accept that situation, forsaking the assembling of themselves together and the vital place that fellowship has. Where the two and the three are gathered together in my name. There's special blessings. I will be present. That's not promised for those involved in virtual church or listening in online. But special blessings are connected with the gathering together of God's people to worship. And now there's these variants. The Indian variant or Delta variant. Various um, mutations of this virus. And people are talking about a third wave. And what lies ahead? Well, there's been very little very little sense of repentance either in the church or in the land because of the coronavirus. It's come and it would seem like people just view it as chance. It just happened. It's there. And people don't take it seriously. And they don't ask why. Why has God brought this plague upon us? Why is his hand so heavy upon us? Our own denomination is suffering. In the last 10 years, we've declined very considerably. Will the Lord remove his candlestick from its place? 
We have to ask these questions. And so in the second place, why has this coronavirus come? Why is this real suffering in this situation? Well, the reason was, of course, the golden calves. You remember how Jeroboam, when he was given by God the ten tribes, he wasn't prepared to trust God and to say, God gave me this country, God gave me this portion of, of the land and took it away from the children of Solomon, the children of David, so the God who gave it to me, he will look after me and I will trust in him. No, he said, I'll, I'll have to develop a new kind of religion that will keep the people from going up to Jerusalem to worship in case they return to the house of David. So he put his faith in himself instead of in the Lord. And he produced a, a new variation of the Old Testament worship. Worshiping Jehovah but worshipping Jehovah at the shrines that he had set up in Bethel and Dan, the golden calves that he had placed there. These be thy gods that took thee out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage. And God hates false worship. God commands how we're to worship him and we must follow exactly the direction that God gives us for worship. And then, of course, along came Ahab and his wicked wife, Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the priest king of Sidon, introducing Baal worship and persecuting the prophets of the Lord. Israel has been like an adulterous wife, like Gomer, Hosea was told to take as a wife a harlot, an unclean woman. And he marries this woman, and this is a picture for all Israel of God's relationship to Israel. Israel are like Gomer, Gomer who follows her lusts. And yet, God is faithful and God is willing to receive Israel back. What are the reasons? If the golden calves and the idolatry were the cause of God's wrath against Israel, what is the reason for God's wrath against us today? Well, we can point to our nation's sins, can't we? We can think of the blasphemy that goes on. God loves his own name. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. What horrible blasphemy is spoken on the radio and on the television. In everyday life, so many people, they can hardly use a sentence, speak a sentence without taking in the name of the Lord or blaspheming and cursing. God sees the Sabbath breaking in our land. The Sabbath used for shops opening and commercial activity and work and football and tennis and all sorts of things. And then there's the murder of the unborn child. More than 200,000 babies were slaughtered last year. How can that take place? without God's anger burning against such wickedness, abortion. And then there's all the adultery and the fornication and the immorality and the homosexuality and all the various corruptions and perversions, all the filthiness that is going on in our society and the pride connected with it. God sees all that. But friends, as I said earlier, it's not the sins of the world that should be concerning us. It's particularly the sins of the church. Your sins and my sins. The great sin of Israel was idolatry. 
You read through the book of Judges, and it's such a sad story. When Israel returned to the Lord, then they were given victory over their enemies. And a few years passed, and they turned to idols again. And then they suffered, and they cried to the Lord and returned. And then God, in his mercy, raised up a deliverer. And after a few years, they turned back to idols once more. And we think, what, what fools they were. I remember as a boy thinking about how foolish Israel were. But are we any wiser? Do you not have your idols too? Is God blind to your idols? What are your idols? The idols are the things that come between you and God, that distract you from the worship and service of the Lord, the things that excite you, the things that take up your mind and your thought. And sadly today, there are many idols in the church. Some people make an idol of their job. Their job is so important to them. Or making money. Money is their God. Or maybe it's football. Maybe it's tennis. Maybe it's the Olympics. Pleasure. Family. A home. Their body, their shape, their looks, their appearance, their car, their clothes. What's your idol? What is it that excites you? What is it that has taken away your thoughts from God? What is it that fills your, your mind and your heart and your time and your attention? Remember, God sees these things. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Why should God have to say that? Remember your creator. How could you possibly forget your creator? But alas. And how could you possibly forget the Lord Jesus Christ and his death on the cross? But alas. Jesus had to give us a sacrament to keep on reminding us of his death. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. You do show the Lord's death till he come. Do it in remembrance of me. Remember my death. Keep on reminding yourself of my death. Remember that I loved you and died for you. Remember that I loved you more than anything else. More than my very life. And let the love of Christ constrain you. How do you respond to his great love to you? How strange it is to see Christians today, and really every one of us, so half-hearted, so worldly, so lacking in zeal. When do you see people crying under the word of God? We used to see it in the past. Why do we not see it now? Because Christians take everything for granted. So hard and cold and dead and lifeless. A bit like the church at Ephesus. You have forsaken your first love. You've taken in another love instead. You've committed adultery from the Lord. And God is saying, what is God saying? He's saying, I'll remove the candlestick from its place. Yes, God's candlestick was in Stornoway. Is it going to be removed? Or the church at Sardis. You have a name that you live. Yes, you have a name that you live, don't you? You have a name that you're a Christian, that you're spiritually alive. You've, you've been regenerated, resurrected. You have a name that you live and are dead. 
Is that the case? Spiritually dead. I will come to you as a thief. When you know not, when you don't expect it. And I will raid you and destroy you, says God. Or like the church at Laodicea. I am rich and increased with goods and a need of nothing. I belong to the free church continuing. And we are a really good church. And we are very sound. And we believe in the Bible. And we stick with it. And uh, we, we attend the church. And we go to the prayer meetings. And we are really good people. You know, there's some of these, some of these other churches, and oh, they're they're not so good, and they're not so faithful, and they're they're a bit weak and wishy-washy here and there, and but we're the free church continuing. I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art poor, and blind, and naked. Do you think of yourself as spiritually poor, spiritually blind, and spiritually naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, I salve so that thou mayest see, to be clothed with, yes, with Christ, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The church at Laodicea, lukewarm. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Could, bo could God be saying that about you? I'll vomit you out of my mouth because you're such a compromiser, so uncommitted, so lacking in devotion, so lacking in enthusiasm for God, no zeal for God, no excitement in your religion, but... All just tradition. Lifeless, cold, hard tradition. Remember, God is watching. And God is judging. And so, in the third place, there's a call to repentance. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Face up to your sin. Search your heart in the light of Scripture. Go through the Ten Commandments and ask yourself, do I keep these commandments? Read them through in the larger catechism with a way they're expounded for you there. It's very searching if you take it to heart. Examine your life in the light of Scripture. See your sin. Confess it. Repent of it. What is repentance? Repentance is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a due sense of his sin, an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, doth with Grief and hatred for his sin. Turn from it with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. We're to be new people. Different. Completely different from what we were. So many Christians today, it seems, they have the name Christian, but really there's very little difference between them. And the good living Pharisee. Very little difference. The same things excite them as the things that excite the world. Come back to God. Cry to Him for mercy. Plead for forgiveness. Surely it's obvious that God is not happy with us today. His hand is heavy upon us. 
You know, even the, the blind Philistines were able to work that out. You remember when they had the Ark of God. They had captured the Ark and put it in the house of Dagon. But they realized that God's hand was upon them heavily. Why? Because he brought in a plague. A plague of tumors. A plague of mice. And because of that, they had to yield to the word of God. And they had to give up the ark of God and return it to Israel. God's hand is heavy upon us. And God is calling you and me to repentance. Why is the why is the pulpit so weak today? Why is the preaching without power? Why don't we see people under conviction of sin? Why don't we see people crying for mercy, seeking the Lord? The power is gone. The power is gone from the pulpit and the power is gone from the pew. Come and let us return unto the Lord. But then, in the fourth place, notice that God is merciful. God is merciful and he will heal. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. The prophet here is making a great promise. He will heal us, he's saying. He will bind up our wounds. After two days he will revive us. And the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. These are wonderful promises. He will heal. He will bind us up. He will take away his virus from us. He will bring revival to the church. God is long-suffering. He's slow to wrath. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his evil ways and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? The Lord loves to be gracious, plenteous in redemption. He delights in forgiving. He will not be angry forever. His anger is but for a little time. And there's these encouragements to us to return unto the Lord, to come to him. We have provoked him. We've often provoked him and provoked him grievously. But yet, if we return, will he not hear? Will he not save all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people willing to receive you, willing to take you back. Israel is like Gomer, the adulteress. But God will receive the adulteress back. He's willing. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Whoso covereth his sins shall not prosper, but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you will hear, if you will hear, will you hear? Will you listen? The Lord is calling. The Lord is pleading with you.
let us return unto the Lord, for he will have mercy. And then we notice the duty of following on to know the Lord. Verse 3, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning. He shall come unto us as the rain and as the latter rain and the former rain upon the earth. We must keep on returning to the Lord. Keep on repenting. Some people think that repentance is something you do when you're converted. You do it once and that's it. What nonsense. That's only the start. Repentance is something you have to do every day. Every day you are to turn from your sins afresh. Every day you are to pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Every day you are to repent. And every day you are to believe afresh in Jesus. That's why it's so crazy of those people who think, once a Christian, always a Christian. I was converted 20 years ago. I'm a Christian. I can do what I like. I'm okay. What a lot of nonsense. No. You're a Christian as you are actively involved in every day repenting of your sins and every day believing in Jesus. And what is the evidence of a person being a Christian? The evidence is daily repentance, daily grieving over sin, daily turning from it, daily laying hold of Christ, daily committing your life to him, every day trusting in him. And if I wasn't converted yesterday, I'm converted today because today I receive Christ and I believe in him and trust in him and claim him as my savior and give up my sins and give my heart and my life to Christ. Is that the way it is with you? An ongoing, living relationship with a holy God and a loving Father and a gracious Savior. Who is a God like unto thee? A God that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage, a God that delighteth in mercy. What a wonderful God we have. Oh, to know him, to know him more and more and more, to come to him and to come to him afresh, to come daily to him. This wonderful God that we have. A superficial repentance is no use. We must confess every known sin and turn from it unto the Lord. And then finally, notice the great promise of revival that there is here. The Lord is saying, after two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight it's not a waste of time seeking the Lord. He does not say to us in vain, seek ye me. But if we return unto him, after two days he will revive us. And in the third day he will raise us up. His going forth is like the morning, like the dawn. Just after five o'clock tomorrow, the sun will come over the horizon. There's a certainty about it, isn't there? It happens. And so, if you repent, if you return, if you seek his face, he will come and he will bless. He will return unto you. Turn unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord. His going forth is like the dawn. It's so certain. He will come as the rain, as the former rain and the latter rain. You know, when, when the ground is parched, 
We haven't had rain for some weeks here in Lewis, and the, the ground is very dry. But if the ground were to continue to get no rain, and the water in the reservoirs started being used up, some of the rivers have already dried up, how quickly Lewis, yes, even Lewis, could turn into a desert. And the plants and the trees would die. And the animals would die. Because there's no rain. And if we don't have the rain from heaven. We spiritually become a desert. And death. Spiritual death. Takes over our island. So we need the former rain and the latter rain. And there's a promise here. In two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up. And we shall live in his sight. Everything we need comes from God. Every blessing comes from him. It's to the Lord we must look. Don't look to man. Don't look to others. Don't put your trust in yourself. But to put your trust in the Lord. Come and let us return unto the Lord. That's what we need today, isn't it? That's what we need here in Stornoway. That's what we need down in Glasgow. A general returning of God's people to the Lord. In repentance, confession of sin. Praying for mercy. And the Lord will not only take the virus from us. But he'll take the worst virus from us. The deadness. The coldness. The hardness. He'll change the desert into a fruitful field. He'll change Lewis again into the garden of God. It's to God we must look. In him we must trust. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord. And friend, if you're not a Christian tonight, remember this. If God deals in a hard way with his own children, and if judgment begin at the house of, the, of God, what shall the end be? For them that know not the Lord. And if God's people. Whom he loved from all eternity. Suffer. What a dangerous position you're in. How shall we escape. If we neglect. So great salvation. Let us pray. O Lord our God. We give thanks that. Thou art gracious and merciful and plenteous in redemption. A God who is ready to receive and willing to forgive. We praise thee, O Lord, that thine arms are stretched out to us. Thou art willing to receive thy rebellious child back into thine own bosom. So help us to return unto thee. Help us, Lord, grant unto us the spirit of grace and of supplication. Help us to humble ourselves before the Lord. Oh, that thou wouldst do a great work. We need thee, Lord. Without thee we can do nothing. Grant us the grace of repentance. Grant us the grace of faith. Grant us the grace to pray without ceasing. Do a great work even in our day, O Lord. And show thy glory in the salvation of sinners. And may we give to thee all the glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.